Hello and welcome to November's episode of Scotland Shop on the Sofa from our brand new HQ. This month we've been exploring all things Clan Ross and it's been a joy to find out more about this resilient ancient clan. We've had lots of fun learning about Clan Ross but sadly we're not experts as much as we wish we were. Please let us know if there's anything you think we've got wrong or if we've missed anything out. We'd also love to hear from you if you have a link to Clan Ross. Reach out in the comments or drop us a message and let us know what being part of the clan and sharing its heritage means to you. As always, we'd like to start at the beginning with the bit of the birth of the clan. The lands of Rosshire existed long before the birth of Clan Ross. It was from this beautiful and fertile Highland County that the clan took their name and where they settled, establishing their early homes in the 11th century. The clan's ambitious and bold nature meant they quickly expanded their territory when one brave Ross made a powerful allegiance with the Scottish king. In 1214, King Alexander II led an army to squash the rival claimant to the throne's rebellion and was aided on his mission by Clan Ross chief, Farquhar McIntyre Sabart. Hopefully I've got that right. <laughs> the king knighted the chief and granted his son lands in Skye and Lewis and thanks, helping to grow the already distinguished Ross name. It is commonly accepted that the clan took their name from their key territory of Rosshire, but there is some debate about the origins of this name. In the ancient Celtic language, a Ross was a promontory or headland, which is high area of ground that juts out over the sea or a large loch. <coughs> this could have been inspired by the land between the Cromarty and Dornoch Firths. Another possible origin is the West Norse word for Orkney, Rossi, which means horse island as this area once belonged to the Norwegian earldom of Orkney. As we briefly mentioned earlier, the first recorded chief of Clan Ross was Farquhar McIntyre Sabart, which means son of priest in English. A lot easier. <laughs> the traditional story goes that he was part of the ancient family who provided the hereditary abbots of Applecross. He was known as a brave warrior and supporter of the Scottish monarchy and was rewarded with the title Earl of Ross. His daring was commemorated in the Chronicles of Melrose, which reported that McIntyre Saga attacked and mightily overthrew the king's enemies, and he cut off their heads and presented them as gifts to the new king. And because of this, the Lord King appointed them a new knight. Having had a brief look at the early beginnings of the clan, we'd now like to explore their lands, and specifically their grand castles in a bit more depth. It seems only right to start with the clan's historic seat of Bal Balmagown Castle, which you can find beside the village of Kildare, deep in the Ross Ross's traditional Highland territory. The first laird of Balmagown was Hugh Ross. He was given the land by his half-brother William, the Earl of Ross, in 1368 and quickly began building the castle. It was then passed on to his stepson in 1375 who expanded the estate, a process which various descendants continued over the following centuries. Throughout its history, Balmagown was often used as an important medieval stronghold, serving as a backdrop to many fearsome battles. It was the scene of several seizures during the Jacobite Risings of the 18th century and later during the two Jacobite rebellions of the 19th century. The castle was also occupied by a government troop in 1746 during the Second Jacobite Rebellion and was heavily damaged as a result. Soon after this, in 1754, Balnagown passed to another branch of the family when it was inherited by Admiral Sir John Lockhart Ross, sixth baronet. The Admiral was saddened at the decaying state that had been left in and dedicated a lot of time and money to improving the Balnagown estate. He was so determined to succeed that he became known as the most efficient and enterprising Highland estate manager of his day. He passed his passion for the land on to his son, Sir Charles Lockhart Ross, who hired renowned architect James Gillespie Graham to carry out a number of Gothic Revival style alterations to the castle, and to plant several striking Italian style gardens. Sir Charles Ross, ninth baronet, then inherited Balmagallon in 1911 and focused his energy on agricultural improvement, introducing the silo and combine harvester to the estate. Sadly, from Charles' death in 1942 until 1972, the castle was left unoccupied and began to fall into disrepair. It seems that the castle wasn't destined to disappear just yet, as in 1972 it was purchased by Mohammed Al-Fayed, 
who, had charm, who was charmed by its beauty even in its less than perfect state. He endeavoured to restore both the house and the grounds, hiring Parisian interior designer Felipe Bella, Bellar, 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 decorator of the Parisian Ritz Hotel to help. Balmagown is now prim primarily a family home, so it is unfortunately not open to the public. However, visitors can take guided, a guided tour of the outbuildings and gardens, which include a 19th century walled garden, an ornamental pond and several follies. The castle grounds are also home to a friendly herd of Highland cattle, who can be seen grazing on the fields during the summer. Like any good ancient castle, the grounds are also host to one or two paranormal visitors. Legend has it that two ghosts haunt, castle, haunt the castle, one friendly, one not so friendly. The first is described as a young girl with bright green eyes. She is believed to be the spirit of a princess who, according to legend, is buried within the walls of the castle. How do you get buried within the walls? Hopefully she was already dead before she was buried. Those who have seen her say that she is a pleasant ghost, who smiles gently and doesn't seem to pose any threat. The second ghost, believed to be that of Black Andrew Monroe, is far from pleasant and most definitely threatening. Black Andrew was described as an evil man who terrorised the local community, carrying out countless heinous acts, including murder and burying his enemies alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lovely. Yeah. He, he sounds lovely. He sounds nice. <laughs> Guests of the castle who have had the misfortune of meeting him describe him as malevolent and, may, and say he seems to take great pleasure in scaring those who come across his path. Our next castle for today is slightly less spooky but no less impressive. Porton Cross Castle is located in Porton Cross on the west coast of Scotland, about three kilometres from East Kilbride. There has been a castle on the site since the 11th century, but the present Tower Castle is thought to date from the mid 14th century. In its earliest days, it was known as Arneal and was used by Clan Ross as a stronghold and home. It is most likely that it was first constructed as a stone-built hall house with a protective structure encasing it to provide defence against any potential invaders. In the late 1400s, upper storeys, an attic and ground floor entrance were added. An oblong keep that is three storeys high with a garret also incorporated into the grounds, again building a strong level of built-in defence. Imagine like having to think about that when you build a house. Like, I'm going to blow <laughs> off and get a ball. <laughs> the castle remained in use until it was badly damaged by a great storm in 1739 and was left uninhabited. It fell into disrepair until it was assigned as a scheduled ancient monument in 1955, which means it is recognised as a nationally important historic property. What Porting Cross lacks in ghost stories, it makes up for in spiritual significance. It is said that Porting Cross Castle was the last resting place of the Great King of Scotland. Legend has it that they were transported via the castle on their way to Iona, where they would be buried. The story goes that they would lay in state at Porting Cross Castle for a short time. While historians can't prove this with 100% accuracy to be true, we think it would make a perfect sense that the regal and noble clan Ross would end up making a home on such blessed ground. Now we'd like to tell you a bit about some famous members of the clan and it's, real, it's a real impressive and mixed crowd. Clan Ross is blessed with a wealth of distinguished and successful members, from fearsome warriors who exerted control over the ancient lands of Scotland to more contemporary stars who have forged their way in politics, music and war across the world. Early members of the clan occupied a high place in society and managed to build some noble family links. One great example is Colonel George Ross, who was a founding father of the United States. He was part of a group of the late 18th century American revolutionary leaders who worked to solidify independence from Great Britain and set up framework of government for the nation. George Ross was born in May of 1730 in Newcastle, Delaware, into a very large family. His father was a Reverend George Anne, the fifth third of Belbear Ross, a clergyman who had emigrated to America from Scotland. Their parental line goes directly back to the very first Earl of Ross. As an adult, George studied law, attaining the bar in Philadelphia at the age of 20 and quickly establishing his own practice. Which I is pretty young to be doing that, isn't it? He was initially on the crown side of politics serving as Crown Prosecutor for 12 years before being elected to the Provincial Legislature 
in 1768. While there, he served on the Committee of Safety, where his sympathies began to change. He came to understand firsthand the binding conflict between the colonial assemblies and the parliament, and consequently became a strong supporter of the colonial legislatures in their many disputes with parliament in Great Britain. Soon after, he was appointed to the Continental Congress, where he became a signer of the Declaration of Independence, cementing his place in history forever. He continued to dedicate himself to politics for the rest of his life until he died at the age of 49 in 1779. This impressive work ethic seems to have endured across the generations and helped other more contemporary bosses gain great success in a variety of fields. One we're sure you've heard of is the iconic Diana Ross who rose to fame as a lead singer of the Supremes, who became Motown's most successful act in 1960s, and one of the world's best-selling girl groups of all time. In total, Ross has sold more than 100 million albums both as a member of the Supremes and as a solo artist. Diana Ross was born in Detroit on the 26th of March 1944. Her early years were incredibly musically rich, and she built friendship with many fellow musicians who would also go on to see astronomical success. She went to school with Smokey Robinson and also joined a music group named the Primates with girls from her neighbourhood. The Primates were a sister group to the male group, the Primes, who would also later gain fame as the Temptations. Smokey Robinson brought the prim Primates to Motown Records and introduced them to its founder, who was suitably impressed. After they finished high school, the group signed a contract with Motown and adapted the name The Supremes. Their achievements were unprecedented as they saw hit after hit with songs such as Baby Love, Stop in the Name of Love and Can't Hurry Love. There's a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> Sing along with you. Know. <laughs> they recorded 10 number one hit singles between 1964 and 1967. In 1970, however, Ross left the group to pursue a solo career. Diana Ross, her debut so solo album included the song Ain't No Mountain High Enough, which would go on to become the first of many solo hit singles. Over the span of her long-lasting career, Diana Ross has sung for the late Queen Elizabeth, performed at the Super Bowl, been honoured with two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and continues to receive countless awards and accolades to this day. On November 16, 2016, Ross was announced as one of the 21 recipients of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honour and in 2023, Supreme's co-founder Ross and the late Mary Wilson and Florence Ballard received the Grammy's Lifetime Achievement Award, making Ross the first woman to win the award twice. It's safe to say that the Rosses are a multi-talented bunch. If you are lucky enough to have Ross blood, we hope you feel inspired hearing about some of the achievements of your peers. We could talk about Clan Ross all day, but sadly we're running out of time in this episode. Before we go though, we need to tell you a little something about our favourite thing here at Scotland Shop. Tartan. If you're looking for a Ross tartan, you won't struggle for choice. We stock the hunting modern, we have the ancient and the weathered. We are wearing the Ross Red modern, I think, um, which is also available in Ancient and Weathered too. Each of these offers a different strength and tone of colour, so you're sure to find one that will suit you. We hope you enjoyed this tour through the history of Clan Ross. There's much more that we would have liked to have shared, but we couldn't fit it all in. If you'd like to find out even more about the clan, please do pay a visit to the newly updated clan page on our website, as well as our blog posts. You can also test your knowledge of all things Ross with our quiz. To stay updated on all of our clan content, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, email newsletter and our social media.